you can take it away. Okay, so um, plants and insects have evolved together, establishing uh, interactive relationships and dependencies on which their survival and the stability of the ecosystem rest. And these relationships can be seen in a number of attributes, including physical characteristics, life, cy life cycle, habitat, and food preferences. My interest in this topic was fueled by work I was doing in my own garden to create pollinator habitat. And when Christy invited us to share our interests with each other in this program, I saw it as an opportunity to learn more. And there's no motivation like a deadline. Now, caveat here, <laughs> uh, I'm not an entomologist, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a botanist or an expert in any other field of natural science. So I've relied upon secondary and tertiary sources and done my best to discern between the bunk and the debunkers. Uh, it, now, I, I just a uh, side note here, I heard Doug Ptolemy give a lecture recently on his, his new book, The Oak, and he said, um, that it was the first time he'd given that talk and that audience I was in was his guinea pigs. So um, I'm gonna make the same um, uh, disclaimer here. I've, I've never given this <laughs> presentation before. And uh, you know, so uh, I'm learning from you as well as you from me. So as I you know, began this research, it didn't take long to be amazed by the complexity and the multidimensionality of the relationships and interactions between plants and insects. And in this presentation, I'm going to survey and really just survey, it's just the tip of the iceberg, some of the fascinating interactions that I learned about. And at the end, I'm gonna to touch briefly upon how devastating it can be when these relationships are threatened. So I'm gonna talk about how plants and insects interact and a little bit about how plants interact with plants and how insects interact with insects. So why do plants and insects interact at all? The number one reason is survival. And really it's based on reproduction. It's survival of the species um, as well as survival of the individual. And that's the driving force in every living organism, whether plant or animal. Plants and insects rely on each other to varying degrees to meet their reproductive and nutritional needs and for shelter and defense. In many cases, it's a mutualistic relationship in which both benefit, but sometimes only one or the other profits from the relationship. Plants rely on insects for reproduction through pollination. We all know that. 80% of all angiosperms, those are the flowering plants, require animals to be pollen vectors, transferring pollen from one flower to another. And of those uh, 80% of, uh, sorry, 30% of all agricultural crops, the food we eat, and the food that the food we eat eats rely upon insect pollination. So this, this, re this relationship between insects and plants is, is extremely important for, for all life on this planet. And plants also rely on insects for protection and defense against other insects. And insects rely on plants for breeding sites as many insects mate and lay their eggs on or uh, in or on host plants or plant material. And insects also rely on plants for protection in the form of refugia or sites for overwintering. And of course, plants are the primary food source of most insects at some point in their life cycles. So neither plants nor animals would manage without the other. From the insects, ex, from the insects perspective, uh, pollination is all about getting fed. So given plants reliance on insects for help with reproduction, nature has provided some very strong incentives to insects, namely in the form of food, pollen, which is protein, lipids, and minerals, and nectar, carbohydrates, and amino acids, and some water. These are the primary lures of insects to plants. 
Insects also spend time on or near flowers looking for other insects and plant material to eat. So it's all about food for the insects. And so what, what attracts them there? So um, they know there are food rewards and they're attracted by the prospects of other rewards and lured by a number of characteristics of the flowers. The shape, color, odor of the flower signals the appropriate insects while the promise of breeding sites and mates lures them in. These signals between flowers and pollinators are morphological adaptations in both insect and plant resulting from coevolution of one with the other over a great long period of time. And the adaptations are called pollination syndromes. They can include visual cues, olfactory or scent cues and shape. An additional adaptation is the correspondence between the plant's bloom time and the insect's feeding time which is a phenological uh, uh, synchrony. So um, visual cues of pollination syndromes would be color, uh, nectar guides, and this bullseye pattern. You can see the nectar guides in this violet on the left and the bullseye pattern made by the coloration of the, of the petals that draws the pollinators straight to where the food is. Generally, pollination syndromes produce mutually beneficial interactions by facilitating the insect's search for food and the transfer of pollen from one flower to the other. I found it particularly interesting that pollinators want to conserve energy and maximize their foraging efficiency and the flowers assist them in several ways. Apparently during pollination, there's a change in the electrical charge on the flower and bees are able to sense this change and will skip foraging at a flower where pollination has already occurred. And so the, the pollen supply is depleted. They are not gonna waste any time poking around an empty flower looking for pollen. So they, they get this, this electrical charge, uh, sens this sensation that the uh, electrical charge is indicating no pollen here, it, you know, it's already gone. Um, okay. And the flowers also signal that um, reduced pollen and nectar supplies, that the, uh, that the pollen and nectar supplies are reduced by changing color, um, often from yellow, which is uh, very attractive to bees, to red, which is a color that they can't see. So you can see in the um, uh, left hand, the upper left hand flower, uh, the asters there, some have yellow centers where there's still pollen and some have red centers where the pollen has already been removed. And so the bees are less likely to see those flowers and uh, won't waste time going to them. The picture on the right is um, also asters, a different kind of asters that close up when um, they close up at night to preserve the nectar, or if the nectar is already gone from a day's worth of foraging, so that um, uh, pollinators will not come looking for nectar and not find any. And then the picture on the bottom is uh, Virginia bluebells. And these are uh, really pretty uh, spring ephemeral, should be coming out very soon. And when they open, when they first bloom, they're pink, which is not attractive. To, um, to the early pollinators, the bees. And then when they uh, develop their pollen, they open, it, pollen is accessible, they turn blue, which is a color that's attractive to, to bees. Um, other cues that are part of the pollination syndromes are olfactory, those are odors or scents. Um, and these are fragrances or odors that plants use to lure the pollinators to them. And each plant can produce the fragrances that are attractive to their particular pollinators. So bees generally like sweet fragrances, butterflies don't seem to have smell receptors and moths that fly at night are not lured by color, but are attracted to uh, strongly fragrant flowers that bloom at night, which coincides with when moths are out flying. 
so moth pollinated flowers are usually white or light colored that are easier to see in the dark. Flies, on the other hand, that are known to lay their eggs on dung and rotting meat are attracted to putrid odors. And so fly pollinated flowers are often dark and red and resemble rotting meat. And this is a picture of skunk cabbage, which also should be coming out very soon, depending upon where you are. And um, it's able to generate heat in, its, in it, the center of its flower. And that lures flies in, they smell this putrid odor that's created by this heat. It's wafting out into the cold air and it draws the flies in because they're looking for a place to lay their eggs. They think there's some rotting meat in there. They go in there, they don't find any place to lay their eggs in there, and they, they, but they fly around looking for it and they pick up the pollen from the flower. And then they move on to the next uh, skunk cabbage, which is probably growing nearby because they grow in the, you know, in, in, a, in like colonies. And um, so they deposit the pollen on the next uh, flower that they enter. Um, okay, so let's move to the next slide. Get it, there we go. Okay, um, flower shape plays a role in attracting insects to flowers too, and it's closely tied to the size and shape of the insect and its feeding apparatus. So butterflies with their broad wings that they spread out, um, they need a, a wide open flower with a landing pad that they can stand on or cling to. And um, they like tubular flowers so they can get their long tongues in to feed, to, to reach the nectar. Um, but they're, they're not sensitive to um, fragrance at all. And in this picture, this monarch butterfly is actually perched on two flowers because these are rather small. But if this were, uh, say, an aster, a disc flower, it would be, um, it could spread out on, on a single flower. Now, moths, as I said, um, are drawn to fragrance, but not color, but they also need a long tubular flower. And these syndromes, these pollination uh, syndromes ha have been summarized many times. You can find these sorts of charts all over uh, on the internet. This one I think is from the US Forestry Service. And you can see the various pollinators across the top and the flower traits that they're attracted to. And um, it's kind of interesting to predict what you might attract when you plant certain flowers or what you might see if you're out looking at a certain kind of flower. But um, one thing I discovered uh, in doing my research is that it's not all that reliable, but it's still interesting information. Now the next page is just more of the same chart uh, for different um, pollinators. Now I, I learned a couple of um, interesting oddities. There is some research that suggests that um, this particular evening primrose with its bowl shaped um, uh, uh, flowers that kind of, you know, like a mega horn or uh, like an ear shaped like an ear, you know, they can catch sounds and vibrations. Um, they sense when a bee is there or when its bee is coming, its particular pollinator is there at the flower foraging for uh, pollen and nectar. And they increase the uh, sugar content of their nectar in response to that particular frequency of vibration. And that sweeter nectar then draws more, po more pollinators which guarantees um, a successful pollination. So now I spoke about pollinator behavior in response to plant use. So now I wanna talk about the herbivore, the insect behavior. So herbivores, the plant eaters um, are known for chewing and sucking uh, sap, eating seeds, burrowing into plant stems for shelter and food. And they rely on plant volatiles. Those are um, chemical um, signals that plants give off the olfactory 
cues to find uh, their host plants. And they've developed special receptors that are specific to their host plants' uh, volatile cues. And herbivores can be specialists eating from only one kind of plant or a small number of related species, or they can be generalists. And this would apply both to um, uh, pollen specialists, nectar specialists, and um, host plants for the larvae. And it's possible to have an insect, uh, uh, an herbivore that will go for nectar from anything, but only pollen from a particular plant, uh, species or a group of species. And as I said, each plant has volatiles um, that are specific to its herbivory. And those volatiles can be both attractants and repellents. And insects are able to distinguish between signals of a of food source and signals of a host plant where it can lay its eggs. So it, it can tell is the signal it's getting where it should go for food, if it's looking for food, or is that a, a plant giving it signal, telling it, you can come lay your eggs here. So if a plant has already eaten and only wants to lay eggs, it's going to pay attention to those um, host plant signals. And if it's laid its eggs and is only out nectaring now, it's going to pay attention to the food signals. To me, this was just math, you know, amazing. Um, now, parasitoids, those are insects that, um, that parasitize other insects and use them as hosts for their larvae. And they can tell from a plant signals whether there is a host insect for it on its plant. So for example, if a tomato is being attacked by a tomato hornworm, it sends out a volatile signal, you know, a pheromone or some sort of a uh, signal to um, the uh, braconid wasp, which is a parasitoid, and says, come on over here. There's a tomato hornworm that you can parasitize and lay your eggs on. And that way, the plant is benefiting from the parasitoid, and the parasitoid is benefiting from the uh, hornworm, the, herb the herbivore that's eating the tomato plant. So what happens uh, uh, to the plant when it's being eaten? Well, they fight back and then the insects escalate the war with counterattacks. And this is really kind of a fascinating um, uh, dance that they do. Um, there are several different kinds of defense mechanisms that plants employ uh, against herbivores. And because most insects prefer not to lay their eggs on leaves that have already had other insects lay their eggs there because that would deplete the uh, supply of food, uh, some plants have evolved structures that mimic the look of eggs and they will deter insects from laying their eggs on them. So this picture here on the left is a passion flower and it's the host to the Gulf flitter fritillary butterfly. It's one example of this. You can see these, these structures um, here, these large sort of egg-like structures um, are fake eggs and they also are uh, nectaries so that they produce you know, a sweet nectar which attracts ants so that in case any eggs do get laid on these leaves, the ants hopefully for the plant will eat the eggs, eat those eggs, and then the plant will be saved. Um, some plants emit repellent odors and others like the milkweed here on the right uh, produce a latex, a sticky substance that deters herbivores. Um, and believe it or not, um, the herbivores learn, they are able to learn that, that a particular plant will produce a substance that they don't like, that they can't tolerate. Um, in the case of milkweed, 30% of all monarchs, um, actually the larvae, the caterpillars, get stuck in the latex and, and they, they die because they didn't learn that lesson. Um, but um, 
the latex also sends out signals to the adult butterflies that that's a milkweed and so it's okay to lay their eggs there. So there's this balancing going back and forth in these, these sort of mixed messages. Another way that plants fight back is by producing toxins and some are always present in the plant like um, uh, it, as in, in milkweed, it's the toxins always there and that's costly to plants because they always have to be making it. But then there are other toxins that are induced by insect attack and that's less costly to the plant itself. And it, another thing that I found very interesting is that some plants will send SOS signals out. When they're being attacked, they will warn neighboring plants that there is an attack underway so that those plants then can prepare their toxins or their defense mechanisms, whatever it is, to ward off um, attack. Uh, I've already mentioned a little bit of predator and parasitoid uh, um, interactions. Uh, and this is a picture of a, a hornworm that's got the, the parasitic wasp cocoons. Um, I mean, this is a really interesting phenomenon how when a plant is uh, unable to defend itself, it calls in these mercenaries and it says, you know, I'm being attacked, but this is, there's a benefit here to you. And so this wasp here in this right hand picture, this teeny tiny little bracketed wasp comes and it injects its eggs. A lot of people think that these white, um, these are cocoons, they're not eggs. The wasp injects its eggs, sticks its ovipositor into the, um, into the inside of this caterpillar, this hornworm, and the eggs, um, uh, uh, the larvae, they, the eggs hatch into larvae and they they um, grow inside the caterpillar. Now they can't, they don't kill it because if they killed it, then they wouldn't have a viable host for themselves. So they manage to keep it alive until the very end when they come protruding out of the um, body of the caterpillar and they spin these silk cocoons. When they come out, they don't look quite like this. They really look like little tiny larvae. And these are the cocoons that they, that they spin once they're outside. And the plants that are calling these um, parasitoids over know exactly which volatile uh, signal to send depending upon what insect is attacking it. It's just a phenomenal uh, thing to me that they have this ability to discern what's attacking them and then to create the proper chemical signal to the parasitoid they want to attract. Something else that surprised me is that uh, some herbivores release substances in their saliva when they're attacking the plant, when they're eating the plant, and, and those substances trigger the production of chemicals in the plant that the plant uses to heal itself. It's like platelets in our, in our blood. They, they can seal up a wound to prevent pathogens from getting in, and that's triggered by the um, the saliva of the particular insect that's eating. And when plants are under attack, um, they, uh, they send defensive compounds to the flowers rather than to the leaves. They protect those flowers. Those are the reproductive organs of the plant. And so they're the ones that they're the most protective of. Some, another piece of, uh, of Something interesting that I actually learned um, in my own garden is that um, because of coevolution of the insects and the plants, the life cycle phenology uh, really um, helps to prevent too much herbivore damage. And this picture here, this is um, a, cl a cluster of sawfly larva, dogwood sawfly larva on a dogwood. And, um, the whole dogwood was covered with them. This is just one leaf. The, every leaf was covered with these larvae. And I was uh, particularly upset because 
they were eating the plant. I mean, they were just completely destroyed. There were no leaves left in a couple of days. But this picture was taken in late September and um, the plant had already gone through most of its life cycle. It had done all the photosynthesizing it needed to do. And so it came back just fine the following year. So the, the fact that the life cycle of the sawfly larva is, of the sawfly puts it um, on the plant late in its, in its own um, season, really saves the plant from damage that could have occurred if it were say a non-native uh, insect that has a different life cycle and was uh, eating the plant earlier in the season when it couldn't recover and needed to live through the, the summer. So what do insects do to counter these defense strategies of the plants? Well, <laughs> they've, got, they've got their own ways. Um, they launch their own counter defenses. And one of them is suppression of toxins. They're able, some of them are able to suppress the toxins. And I understand that aphid honeydew um, suppresses the production of toxins in some plants. Um, some insects are able to detoxify the toxins. Some can sequester the toxins. And in the process, they toxify themselves. So this is what happens with monarch butterflies, for example. They can sequester the toxins in the milkweed, and then they uh, become toxic themselves to anything that might predate them. And this is a very interesting process because what, when an, an insect is able to um, acquire the adaptation to eat a plant that is generally toxic, it has created a resource for itself without a lot of competition from other insects that have, haven't acquired that adaptation. And there are other strategies, for example, um, some have work around feeding strategies and like the, the monarch, let's see, um, I thought I had a picture, I guess I don't. The monarch, if you ever watch a monarch caterpillar eating, it will uh, crawl onto the milkweed leaf and it will go to the end of the leaf and start eating. And as soon as the latex comes out, it knows it doesn't wanna get that all over its face. It will crawl back up to the stem of the plant or part way up the leaf and uh, sever the veins that the milkweed flows in. So basically like a tourniquet, it cuts off the flow of latex and then it goes back to the tip of the leaf and starts eating again. And so that's how it's managed to get, away, uh, get around uh, getting stuck in the latex. And another feeding strategy is um, there are some toxins that are only produced during uh, daylight. Uh, primarily these, these would be, for example, the nightshade family. And so there are some insects that have adapted to eat at night. They're night feeders, so they avoid encountering those toxins. So those are their workarounds. Now I have just a little sort of a, a quiz here. Um, these are six pictures of things <laughs> that are have, have one thing that they have. It's like um, they what's missing from this picture? Um, and I, since I can't see you, <laughs> you can't talk to me, I'll tell you what's missing from this picture uh, that they all have in common is a monarch butterfly. And um, what's interesting to me, what was really interesting anyway, at, when I learned this is um, they are monarch beetles, I mean, milkweed beetles, milkweed bugs, um, uh, this, these are milkweed tussock moths. This is the moth, this is, these are the larvae. And then there are two birds. There's the um, black-backed orioles and the black-headed grosbeak. Uh, this is the grosbeak in the upper right and the oriole here. Now, um, you might be looking at this picture and there's something very obvious stands out to me, which is their coloration. They're all orange or red and black. And um, that those, those colors are meant to be a signal to other animals that they are toxic. And that's because they've been feeding on the milkweed and they've got those glycosides, those toxins in them. 
Uh, however, these two birds are frequent predators at monarch uh, overwintering sites and a very large percentage, I think over 60% of the total monarch mortality at the, at the overwintering sites in Mexico is because of predation by these two birds. So I found that very interesting. They're able to eat the monarchs and, and um, survive. And these, it, these insects are able to eat the milkweed and survive. So I talked about the insects role in plant reproduction. And now lest you think that plants get all the benefits, insects need plants for reproduction too. And you might not think that plants play a role in insect reproduction, but you're wrong. Insects use flowers as mating sites. And as um, you can see over here, this bottom picture, these are two, um, I believe they're bald headed hornets and they are mating right there on a leaf. And up here in the uh, upper right corner, those are uh, squash bees. Squash, um, well, that's a squash bee that hangs out in the squash flower and it hangs out there waiting for females to mate with. And here are, uh, here's a pair of bees mating inside the flower. Be the bees hang out at, at these flowers uh, because they don't travel far from where they eat. They nest and eat more or less in the same place and they know they're gonna find a mate if they stay there long enough. The squash bees are specialists and they only go to squash flowers. Insects also uh, use plants as places to lay their eggs and stash them away for the winter. And um, actually I'll show you some pictures in, in a minute or so of um, some examples of that. Now let's move on here. Um, these are egg laying sites. You can see in the upper right here, these are uh, bee larvae that are laid into um, the hollow stems of plants. And these are oak galls. These are um, uh, uh, wasps that, um, that, are, uh, that have made, uh, made galls. Well, the, 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 the oak has made the gall around the, um, around the egg and um, that's where they stay while they mature. This is the, um, this on the left here, this is a goldenrod gall fly um, has, has uh, been laid, uh, the egg has been laid into this, uh, into the stem of the goldenrod and the goldenrod made the gall around the uh, larva. And in this particular picture, uh, the goldenrod gall is up on the top and another, um, another, this is now a wasp came along and decided to crash that party and, and went into the gall and laid its own eggs inside that gall. And the um, goldenrod gall, the fly was killed and the wasp remained. Now it doesn't always um, end well for the the, the uh, wasps or the flies in the galls because here you see um, the woodpeckers are known to predate these galls all winter long. They know what they're looking for and they, and they find their food. Now, herbivorous insects may inflict damage on their hosts, but they do a lot of good for the plants too. And insects frequently rescue plants from herbivores. And I, we already uh, saw, I told you about the um, tomato hornworm. And here's, on uh, the bottom is a picture of a um, predatory stink bug eating a paper wasp. And now that's not, um, an herbivore, they are uh, both insectivores, but um, it's a, an example of how these insects are, are really useful in, in the ecosystem in protecting, ultimately protecting plants and um, uh, by, by predating other insects. So now what happens 
when these signals that are so important, these are, these are very complex interactions and communication, what happens when they get interrupted or confused or eliminate, eliminated? And um, I mean, as you can imagine the havoc that would occur if those signals were interrupted. And that havoc would really be very destructive to the entire ecology and agricultural systems and would threaten even human life. So what are the potential interrupters? Well, it's still not fully understood. We're, you know, scientists are still exploring and studying, but here are some suggested impacts. So I'll mention some related to, uh, well, I'll just uh, read from the slide, degradation of habitat, loss of native, due to loss of native species, introduction of cultivars and the invasion of non-native species, um, use of pesticides and climate change. Those are all um, factors that could impact the production of these important uh, signals between plants and insects. Now, in terms of climate change, uh, elevated temperatures and changes in atmosphere caused by climate change impact the plant physiology. They change the chemistry of the leaves and the chemistry of the volatile emissions that govern the interactions between plants and insects. So these signals that the insects and plants are, are meant to be receiving and sending back and forth, they get, um, they get interrupted, they get, they're changed because of uh, the, the chemical um, interaction, the chemical, the impact on the chemistry of the plant from due to climate change. And plants may begin to grow more quickly because of changes in, in the atmosphere and the temperature, but with reduced nutritional value to herbivores. So the insects then end up eating more in order to get the nutritional, um, uh, their nutritional needs fulfilled. And this could lead to more damage that the plants then can't defend against. Um, other changes due to um, Climate change are the phenological relationships are altered. Plants may be blooming sooner that, and their pollinators are not out yet or vice versa. Um, that happens also. Um, the life cycles are out of sync. Insects can produce more generations per year because they have a longer warm you know, growing period and that puts more stress on the plants. And this is particularly troubling in the case of specialists, specialist herbivores, specialist pollinators that rely on one or a few plants as hosts or insects as pollinators. So if one partner in the relationship is threatened, both partners are threatened and everything that depends upon them. So if insects are threatened, everything else in the food chain is threatened as well. Um, so that's pretty much the end of what I, I wanted to talk about. Um, it's about as deep as I could go in, in this topic without um, needing a degree in biology or entomology, but um, I thought that it was uh, really astonishing to see some of these interactions and uh, it gives me a much better understanding of what's happening in my garden for sure. Thank you, Lynn. That was wonderful. It was great. You did an excellent job um, pushing the envelope and yeah. the, the layout was nice. It was nice to look at visually and very interesting information and you delivered it well too. So thank you. Um, let's see, I'm gonna take some questions now. Let's see, uh, does anybody have questions? We have some good feedback. T Tony Henderson has a question. Okay. Right? Oh no, you're just clapping. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> uh, let's see, is there evidence or speculation? Uh, Tracy asks, and they put climate change. Tracy, can you clarify what you mean, what your question is? Um, maybe he means, is there I, actual, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? I unmuted my microphone. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. I, I'm sorry that I missed the first half of the presentation, but uh, 
uh, it ended with the uh, uh, climate change affecting the signaling between the plants and insects. And, and I wondered if this was mainly speculation or if you could show some evidence of that. Uh, are there ca cases that you can point to? Well, I can't right now, but it, it's clearly, it's something I read and it's a concern that, um, that scientists have. I think that um, they've done some sort of laboratory testing um, and off the top of my head, I can't remember, but I do have all of my notes. And if you want, I'd be happy to send you some references to this. You know, it gets very specific. They go into the particular chemicals, all the, the biochemistry, which was really, um, frankly, way over my head. Um, so I didn't, I didn't want to go into it in detail because I couldn't possibly defend someone else's um, uh, conclusions. But it's just something that that I made I, note of. I've, I've read quite a bit of that stuff myself, mm -hmm. and it, it and it seemed like it was mainly uh, speculation that uh, you know if if we raise two tenths of a degree uh, uh, Celsius, we're, such and such is apt to happen. And I, I haven't seen any evidence of any of this stuff actually being documented as, as having happened. Well, I do, I do think that one thing that has been documented is the nutritional um, content of nectar. Uh, based on, uh, you know, depending on, on the climate conditions. That I, I believe I've seen. Um, I mean, I can't, um, I, I can't offend anybody else's mm -hmm. conclusion, obviously, but, you know, these are just things that we need to be aware of I and mean, we need to think about. Okay, thank you. I, uh, yes, I, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing the uh, recording of this because uh, I, I missed the first half. I was busy taking my daughter to a medical appointment that took a lot longer than what I expected. Okay, um, let's see. Next question from John Sander is, uh, he said, that was very interesting. Could you suggest some good books on plant and insect phenology? And somebody else, just as a follow-up, somebody else said that um, some references to read further would, would be wonderful. So. So Lynn, if you do have those, if you want to send them to me, I could send them to everyone who, sure. who participated tonight. I will do that. Um, there's an awful lot of stuff. You know, I think that um, the COVID and the, the, the Zoom boom has really made a lot of um, research accessible to people who, like me who would never find it. So you can find lectures given by people like Heather Holm and even Doug Tallamy. Um, now, and these are the people, these are the, the scientists who are doing the work. And uh, you can find them online now if you, if you Google. So um, that's one thing I would suggest, but I definitely can uh, send, Christy, I can send you a list of some of the resources that I used. Okay, thank you. And then Andrew um, put a link to the National Phenology Network in the mm -hmm. chat box for those of you who yeah. are interested. And Lori mentions the Xerces Society has a lot of good research and interesting articles on this topic. So thanks yeah. to both of you. Yeah, the, the Ecological um, Landscape Alliance is another place um, to go for really interesting uh, references. Okay, oh. thank you.